Amen. Well, we are finding ourselves today at the uh, culmination of the book of Exodus, and I know for some of you that went fast and you've got lots of questions, and just encourage you to take what you've learned through this series and go back and read it over and, and uh, study those questions and ask them for yourselves. Come and ask them if you, if you can't find the answers, but, but we're going to jump in and talk about God's presence today, which might be the culminating idea of the book of Exodus. But I want to start by, by talking a little bit about why, why somebody might want to be a Christian, why you might even want to, want to be a Jesus follower. And I think there's a lot of reasons that people become Christians. A lot of, for a lot of people, it's they're going through some sort of physical issue, whether it be, be a need of food or clothing, of you know, a lack of wealth, of, of poverty, and they're, they're looking for answers. A lot of people might be dealing with other physical needs, illness, injury, things of that sort, and you, and, and you hear that, well, sometimes people are prayed for and, and they get healed, and so you come into a church looking for, for, for healing of physical needs. Sometimes it's a social need. Sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a need for people, a need for community, um, a need for belonging that brings people into the church, that they come into a church to see if there's like-minded people, and they, and they find some, and Maybe join a small group and, and become a part of the community. Other people have a, maybe emotional type of needs, past traumas and things that they're wrestling with that cause them to, to have to, to wrestle, um, that they don't want to wrestle alone over, and they find that in the church that there's answers to many of those questions. And yet I'm finding that there's an increased uh, category of people that, that are coming into the church because they have spiritual needs. Now, physical, social, emotional types of needs, these all f- follow, fall into a category that you might call materialism, the material things of this world, that there's something about this world that is not fulfilling them, so they come to see if, if the material needs can be fulfilled in the church, and yet, and yet there's a growing category of people who basically have those met, but just have like a a spiritual deficit, and so they, they come to the church looking for a spiritual experience. They, they come to the church looking to enter into the presence of God. And I, and, and I think that where if you look back at your testimony and when you became a Christian and what the reasons are that you first associated with a church or, or, or with Jesus or with a community of believers, you might find that it was initially a, a physical reason. You were looking for something there. Maybe. But I think all of us eventually grow into a longing for something that is truly spiritual. We we come to worship on a Sunday morning much like this, longing to enter into the presence of God, to sense his presence and and to know him, and always to grow in our knowledge of him and to kind of go go deeper in what we know. Now, as we look to the text today, we're going to be talking about Israel's tabernacle. And Israel's tabernacle served this purpose, and I'll explain what the tabernacle is in a moment, but it served this purpose, to bring people into God's presence, to, to, put, to lay before them a pathway to, to know God deeper and to know them more. And so let, let's go to the earthly ta- tabernacle. Now, the word tabernacle basically means tent, okay? So we're, we're, we, jo- we like to joke that, we're, you know, that we, we set up our tabernacle on Sundays because we put up our tent tops, you know, um, because we're a church without a building, then we, we're tabernacling. Now, Israel had just been delivered out of slavery in Egypt, and so they exited Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, the Reed Sea, and entered into the wilderness, and now in the wilderness, the Almighty God, Yahweh, the one true God, is going to give them, uh, uh, to give them a way to experience them even in the wilderness. So notice that even if they're even if they're not seeing their physical, emotional and social needs met the way that they that they that they expect, he's going to give them a way to experience his presence even in the wilderness. And so let's let's look at this tabernacle or this tent. Exodus 25, 8 and 9 and 40. It says by the way, if you don't have your slides up for this part, you're prob- you might want those, especially if you're a visual person. Um, I've got some diagrams 
And so pull those slides up. Again, palmdale.church front slash media. Or if you're a member of the church, you'll find them in the band app. Um, and you can get some graphics that are going to kind of show you uh, some of the elements of the tabernacle. We're going to go through a lot of them, and so it might be helpful for you to see that. So it says this. It says, They are to make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell or live among them. You must make it according to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle as well as the pattern of all its furnishings. Be careful to make them according to the pattern you have been shown on the mountain. Now, this is, this is important. See, I was emphasizing this word shown. Uh, as we go through the text, you can see the directions were given, but apparently Moses received some clear direction from God, from Yahweh, uh, as to how to build this tabernacle. You know, make it seven and a half, seven and a half, lots of some numerical things. Clearly Moses wrote down at some point. But it doesn't say, according to all that I tell you. Yahweh didn't say, build it according to all that I tell you. He said, according to what you have been shown. And, and you go, what's the difference? Well, I think the difference is, is huge. Because, see, Moses actually got to see something. And, yeah, he wrote down some details. But what's written is no blueprint, right? If you've ever built anything, right? You get that Ikea furniture. I'm not talking about building a building. But you get that Ikea furniture. You ain't never getting that together without the blueprint, without the, those instructions. Okay? So... Moses had more than these handful of loose details that are recorded in the book of Exodus. He was actually shown what this thing was supposed to look like. Okay? So let's, let's think about, the, about this. What was Moses shown? Well, look at Hebrews 9, 11, and 12. Here the author of Hebrews, he's actually reflecting on Jesus. He says, Christ has appeared as a high priest for the good things that have come. And the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered the most holy place once and for all time. And I want you to notice this. We're going to go back to this, uh, to this section of scripture um, at the end of the message. But where Jesus has gone when he left this earth is to a more perfect tabernacle that is not of this earth. And so as we look to the tabernacle, and then later to the temple that was erected in Jerusalem, what we're going to see is that there's a patterning of eternal things. That there is an eternal tabernacle that Moses got to see. He got to peer into eternal things. And he's not the only one in the scriptures to do this. Most notable is the Apostle Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians. He too got to look and to see into uh, into the throne room of God. So much so that he became prideful and God humbled him, had to humble him for it. We also get details in the Revelation. John, the Apostle, got to look and to see into eternal things. And he actually gets to reveal some of those things to us that we'll look at in a few moments. But this is an eternal tabernacle of God where, where God lives and Moses got to look in and to see these eternal things. Whoops, I just closed my notes. Let's look at some of the elements of the tabernacle. I'll try to go through these qu- quickly. The first is actually the courtyard. If you're looking at your slides, there's a, there's a wall made of cloth that is around the outside. So you might look around and go, okay, if there was a wall around us here, you know, that that we have, and there's a veil that creates a doorway that enters in to the courtyard. And if you were an average run-of-the-mill Israelite, okay, you're not a priest, um, you're not the high priest, you're an Israelite. And so you would go to the temple, or to the tabernacle, And you would enter into this first place, this courtyard. And in the courtyard there is where you would offer your sacrifices. So sacrifices for your own sins, for the sins of your family, um, and, and thanksgiving offerings, and goodwill offerings, and drink offerings. You would do these there in the courtyard with a priest. Okay? And so there's a couple of things going on here in the, in the, in, in this courtyard. There's two pieces of furniture. Um, The first, well, two of note, there's actually three, but there's two of note. The first is the bronze basin. And and we read about that in Exodus 30, where it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, make a bronze basin for washing and a bronze stand for it. Set it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his sons must wash their hands and feet. Okay, so there was an issue of what we call ceremonial purity. That in order for the priests to be able to do 
divine, heavenly, spiritual things, they actually had to go through ceremonial washings. Okay? And, and, and so when you hear about ceremonial washings, what, you're th- what you should be thinking of is washing off your humanity in a sense. Like washing off, or at least washing off the fallenness of humanity. That's probably a better way to say it. That because sin has entered the world and people participate both in unclean and also in uh, sinful things, that, that they need the priests themselves, who are human like anybody else and sinful like anyone else, they actually have to go through a ceremonial washing in which the Lord purifies them so that they can enter into God's presence and, and also become the facilitator to bring other people with them. And so they wash in the basin for two reasons. The first reason is so that they can go to the other piece of furniture that is in the, in, in the courtyard there, which is the, the altar, the bronze altar. And that's where they offer most of the sacrifices of the temple. But also so that they can enter into the holy place. There's actually, if you're looking at your diagram, a tent in the courtyard that is called the holy place that they have to enter into. Okay. Let's look at the altar, and then we'll look at this holy place. So Exodus 7, verses 1 and 2 says, You are to construct the altar of acacia wood. That's kind of interesting. It's a very hard wood. Um, it's dense, it, and it doesn't deteriorate over time. And so it's, this altar is made out of this type of wood so that it's going to be durable. The altar must be square, 7.5 feet long by 7.5 feet wide. It must be 4.5 feet high. Make horns for it on, one of the four, on each of its four corners, the horns are to be of one piece, overlay it with bronze. So you've got a wooden fire pit, if you will, that is then overlaid with bronze so that the wood doesn't catch fire. And it's made of durable wood so that as it gets heated up, it's not going to deteriorate. They're going to want to use this over time. And, and again, they're gonna, this is where people are going to come in. The Israelites are going to come in. They're going to bring, like, let's say, a lamb with them to offer a sin offering for their family and for themselves. And so they go and they actually offer their, their sacrifice there. Now, one of the things that we miss when we think about often, especially as Christians, when we think about the offerings that people would make at the temple, some people will get an image that you bring your offering and you have to sacrifice it. And I know this is hard as modern people for us to swallow, that they're actually like slaying an animal and burning parts of it and doing things with other parts of it. Some of it gets eaten, some of it gets burned. Um, I know it's hard for us to kind of swallow that because we get our meat over at Stater Brothers, at Costco, right? And it never looks like an animal for us, at least not usually. Actually, I bet you guys do. But <laughs> pointing to Cody's parents back there. But most, most of us get meat that doesn't look like an animal. Um, and so you think, well, they had to go and they had to actually sacrifice their animal. Um, other people get a different image, um, and I think this is probably more common, that you bring your lamb and you come up with your lamb or your two doves or whatever it is that you're going to sacrifice, and you hand it over to the priest, and the priest does the sacrifice, and you observe. Um, it's actually, the truth of it is somewhere in between, that what the priest is doing, the priest is the expert on entering into the holiness of God, entering into the presence of God. He's, he's gone through the ceremonial washings and he's come and he has an understanding of the law of God and the purpose and the symbolism of each of these sacrifices so that when you come, he can facilitate worship for you. He, so, so if I were to bring you know, a goat to offer as a sacrifice, the priest would actually say to me, hold the horns of the goat. And then the priest would kill the animal and drain the blood. Um, and, and, but, but I would do that there with him. He's the expert who is walking me through this, facilitating this for me. Worship was always something that you do, not something you merely observe. Worship has never been something to observe and receive some kind of spiritual benefit from. It was always something that you got, you had to get your hands dirty. And I don't think that's really any different today, except that we don't have to get our hands dirty in the same way. Let's talk about the tent of meeting, because there's more to the tabernacle than what happens in the outside courts there. The priest would facilitate worship there, but then the priests also had daily responsibilities within the actual tent of meeting or the holy place. Look at Exodus 30, 20. 
It says, whenever they enter the tent of meeting or approach the altar or minister by burning a food offering to the Lord, they must wash with water so that they will not die. The belief was that if anybody who is not ceremonially clean enters into the tent, then they will die. And I don't know if that ever happened exactly. Um, I know that there were poor offerings offered by Aaron's sons and that they were consumed by fire. But at fear of death, you would enter. And that, that meant a couple of things. It meant that if you were a regular is- Israelite, you weren't one of the priests, that there was a curtain. And you weren't even allowed to look beyond that curtain. You weren't allowed to go in there. What happened in there belongs to holy things for consecrated priests. And you stayed on the outside. You stayed on the outside. But the, the priesthood, they would do their ceremonial washings in the basin. And then they would go into the holy place and God would declare them clean and pure according to his law and according to his standards. And they could enter in to perform sacrifices. We might call them special sacrifices within the tent of meeting. Now there's two rooms in the tent. There's a big room in the front and there's a small room in the back. And any of the priests could enter into this first room to offer sacrifices once they've washed in the basin. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at what's in this first room, the larger room here. The first thing that's there is an incense altar. An incense altar. Look at uh, verses 1 and 7 of chapter 30. It says, You are to make an altar for the burning of incense. Make it of acacia wood, that same wood that's really dense. You don't want it to catch fire. Aaron must burn fragrant incense on it. He must burn it every morning when he tends to the lamps. So the purpose here of this altar of incense is that the priest could send, could send up an offering of incense to the Lord. It was supposed to burn regularly. Notice that he was supposed to burn it every morning. That every morning when the priest, whoever was assigned to do it that day, entered into the holy place, they, needed to, they, need, they had to bring in incense with them, and the first thing they did is they went to offer that incense on the altar of incense. Now, incense has some interesting symbolism. Incense symbolizes prayers going up to God. You get this sense that, that when, you, when you pray, that as we prayed, that we're, we talk about it a lot as like talking to God. But it's like, where do, those, where do those words go? Because if I talk to you and you're right in front of me, like I'm talking to you right now, I know my, that my words escape my mouth and they go to you right here. Well, they, would, they, they imagined that the Lord was in the heavens, that he was, because he is higher, that he is, I don't, I don't know to what degree they really thought he was like up there, but they understood the, the Lord as ideologically higher. And so they would go up on mountains to worship God because that was to get higher and closer to divine things, to holy things. And so they offer incense and you know, we're scientifically minded today, and we understand that if you burn incense, that at some point those, the smoke becomes particulate matter that comes back and settles down to earth. The Israelites, whether they understood anything like that or not, um, didn't, didn't really care. They understood that smoke goes up, and, and, and it enters into the throne room of God. And so they would go in to offer this incense as a way of Again, facilitating worship for the people so that as the people of Israel would pray to God, now their sort of official priest there in the temple or in the tabernacle would offer that sacrifice of of incense to bring the prayers up into the throne room of God. It was, it was like a delivery system, if you want to, if, if, if you will, like those air tubes, right? Except, except like in, on a spiritual level, right? I don't mean to minimize it when I joke. Now, this, this altar of incense, nothing was to be done about it. It was only for prayer. The only thing that they ever did with the altar was on the Day of Atonement, on Yom Kippur, the, the day when the high priest would offer, would offer a sacrifice for the sins of Israel as a whole. They would take some of the blood of the animal and they would enter into the holy place with it, and they would consecrate the altar with it. 
And that consecration was a special prayer that reminded the people of Israel that they, were the, that they were the chosen people of God and that through the law of God and the shedding of blood that they were forgiven and that through that forgiveness of sins that they are restored in relationship with God so that they can commune with Him. See, what, what's happening here is that even if you're the average everyday Israelite, the tabernacle and the priesthood is facilitating your worship. It's bringing you in closer to the center of God. So much so that even your prayers come right before the Father. The other things that were in there, there's a table of showbread. We'll do these, this one faster. Exodus 25, 23, and 30. You are to construct a table of acacia wood, 36 inches, 18 inches wide, 27 inches high. Put the bread of the presence on the table before me at all times. And the key word there is before me. That the Lord uh, saw this bread as being placed before him. It's called the bread of the presence. That it's the bread that re represents the, the sufficiency of God to provide for his people. Remember, remember, sometimes we come because we have needs, even physical needs. And the bread of the presence is, is supposed to make the Israelites think about the manna in the wilderness and the meat, the quail that they received at night, the provision of God that their sandals didn't wear out as they wandled, wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. This, this, this idea of the supernatural provision of God in caring for his people and to help them to remember that. And then they would actually burn incense under the loaves. As, in, in other words... As a, as a thing, so that as God is saying, I have, remember that I have provided you, they are saying, thank you as the incense goes up that you have provided for me. And then there's the lampstand. And this one's, I mean, just limitless imagery related to the lampstand. But you may, you may be aware of the menorah that's used in, in various uh, Jewish celebrations, a seven-tiered candelabra. Well, that's where it comes from, the lampstand in the tabernacle. Exodus 25, verse 31 and 37. You are to make a lampstand out of pure hammered gold. It is to be made of one piece. Its base and shaft, its ornamental cups, and its buds and petals. Make it seven lamps and set up so that they illuminate the area in front of it. Now, okay, it's a lampstand. It serves two purposes. The tabernacle is overlaid with four layers of cloth and animal skin. It's probably like eight inches, ten inches thick, maybe a foot thick, with all of its layers. And it has a veil. It has a veil that separates the ordinary from the divine. It keeps the ordinary people in the courtyard and allows the consecrated priests to enter in. And because of that veil, that means that the room is dark. And so it serves a practical purpose of lighting the room. And that's literally what it says. It's literally what it says. And set them up so that they illuminate the area in front of it. So that if you're over at the table of showbread trying to light the incense, you can see what you're doing, right? So there's a practical element, but there's a figurative element of, of it too because the lamps show up all across the scriptures in other ways. So in Zechariah 4, verses 2 through 6, for example, we've got a, this image of Zechariah. He's a, he's, a, he's a prophet of God, and he has, a, he has a vision where he meets an angel. And so he says this, he says, I see and behold a lampstand of all gold with its bowls on the top and its seven lamps. He's having a vision of the lampstand in, inside the holy place. Now, mind you, prophets weren't priests. Prophets and priests are different things. Prophets speak according to the unction of God. Priests are consecrated for the work of God in the tabernacle. He's never seen the lampstand. He's never seen it. All he knows about the lampstand is whatever maybe a priest has told him who's actually seen it. Maybe they drew him a sketch. I don't know. Maybe he was a good writer. You know, but he sees this and he knows that this is the lampstand, the menorah of God, the one that is in the holy place. Okay, so then, then I said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these, my Lord? Yeah, what's going on with this candelabra, right? The angel spoke to me saying, this is the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yahweh of hosts. He's giving a message to Zechariah to give to Zerubbabel, who's the governor of Israel at this time. Israel, this is in the second temple period. Israel had come out of exile, and the, the king of Persia had allowed them to come back and rebuild the temple, and they were still 
under Persian rule, so he allowed them a governor of their own people, and that's who Zerubbabel is. And Zerubbabel was a capable leader. He was a politician, I imagine, probably knew how to lead troops. He definitely knew how to organize people because he was in charge of the rebuilding of the city walls and of the temple in Jerusalem. And here, Zerubbabel is receiving a message. When, when, when Zechariah asks about the lampstand, the angel's answer is, give this message to Zerubbabel, not by your might, not by your power, but by the Spirit of God. See, the lampstand represents the Spirit of God given to his people. So that, so, that, so that it's the Spirit of God that is the lampstand that illuminates, that illuminates everything that we do. So that, I don't know, me as a pastor of a church, or our elders, our pastors of our church, that, that we don't want to say, well, you know, we're good, we're, we're good at organizing people, and, 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 you know, one person's good with numbers, and another person is good at team building, and another person is good at speaking, and, and, and we rely on our own power, but rather, we seek God, and we ask him to reveal to us the truth by his spirit, and that's what the lampstand represents, so that the priests never start to think, well, as long as I do this right, then God will accept me. But that it, no, it's only as the Lord reveals his light to you by the lampstand that you, that you are acceptable, that you can enter in, that you can do what's required. And so the priests regularly enter the holy place, but, but only the people, but, but not the people. They stay in the courtyard. And then it's not even every priest that can enter into the most holy place. Look at, look at Hebrews 9, 6 through 7. The priests enter the first room repeatedly. In other words, every day they're going into the big room that's got the table of the showbread, the incense altar, and the menorah. Okay? But the high priest alone enters the second room. There's another veil. There's another level. It's, it, it's, further, it, it's, it's further up and further in. It's always, it's always further up and further in. There's another veil with another room. And he only does that once a year and never without the shedding of blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people that the people had committed in ignorance. So now we've got the high priest who on the day of atonement sheds the blood on the altar, consecrates the incense altar, washes in the basin, and now enters into the holy place, the most holy place. It's concentric circles. It's patterning. That as you go closer to the center of the tabernacle, that you're going, you're getting closer to the heart and the presence of the Almighty. So the presence of God, or the fullness of the presence of God, you might say, now resides here in this inner room in the tabernacle. And we're told in Exodus that, that, it, that the pillar of cloud that followed the Israel, or that, that the Israelites followed by day, and the pillar of fire that they followed at night, that it actually rests on the most holy place. And the belief is that this pillar of cloud and par- pillar of fire, it's, it's not just a, for directions so that they know where to go in the wilderness, but it's actually for connecting heaven to earth. It's for connecting heaven to earth so that they know where the presence of God is. And it comes down and it rests in the center of the, of the room, of the small room, on what is called the Ark of the Covenant. I know Ark means like something like box, okay? We could just call this the Box of the Covenant, um, but because the King James Bible was translated Ark, um, uh, it seems weird to us now to just call it a box, so... The Ark of the Covenant, the Box of the Covenant, is, re- is referred to in Exodus 25. And it says this, it says, They are to make an ark of acacia wood, and then make a mercy seat of pure gold. Make one cherub at one end, and one cherub at the other end, and its two ends make the cherub of one piece with the mercy seat itself. He says, I will meet with you there above the mercy seat between the two cherub that are over the ark of the testimony. I will speak to you from there about all that I command you regarding the Israelites. Here's here's the picture. There's a box. And on it is what they call the mercy seat. And that might not be a meaningful word uh, term to you. 
Um, but in the ancient world, in a throne room, another way of referring to a throne was to call it the judgment seat or the seat of judgment. Because, see, that's what happens when you come before a king. And I always think about the emperor's new groove. So if you ever, you know, and I'm sorry I bring this up whenever I talk about the throne room. But I love the, scene, the scenes where they're coming into the, into the, the throne room. And they're, and, you know, and, they're, and, they're, and they're like, you know, this is happening, that's happening. My family's not getting any food, this and that, right? And then the king is judging, right? Or Yzma is in, at one point. Anyway, but that's kind of the idea. That's an idea that comes from the ancient world. That's actually a pretty good contextual scene of what is happening in an ancient throne room with an actual king seated on a throne. Is that he is judging e cases, and maybe you're on trial for some reason. You committed theft or murder or something like that. Your judgment could include, include condemnation. Maybe you're in a dispute with a neighbor. He's going to decide, the, the judge, the king, is going to decide who's, who's, who has favor. And, and just reflecting on last week's, week's message, that whenever we, we put God, the merciful, loving God, on the judgment seat, it becomes not a seat of judgment, not a seat of condemnation, but a seat of mercy. It becomes a seat of mercy because although the Lord has fulfilled the law, when we come before him sinners, he fulfills his law, he is going to judge, he is going to place condemnation. But the condemnation that belongs to you and I fell on Jesus. That Jesus went and died the death that he was not supposed to die so that we could be accepted. So the condemnation is still paid, but it's paid by Jesus so that we receive mercy. And in case you thought that the Old Testament was just about like an angry God who condemns and destroys, and then the New Testament is about a loving God, I want you to see that it's one story, that it was always about mercy, and it's never not been about justice, but it's always been about justice enacted in mercy, so much so that God would send his own son to die for you so that you can be accepted by him. And so there, there's a mercy seat that, that the judge comes down. The, the, the image is that, is that Yahweh comes down, you know, through the cloud, right? Comes down to be seated on his throne. And then, and then he says, you know, and we always say that oh, it was only the great high priest who was able to enter in. Well, that's true-ish. Because there was one other person who got to go into the Holy of Holies, into, this, into the center room, and that's Moses himself. Because it says right here in the text, I will speak to you from there about all that I command you regarding the Israelites. And so Moses goes in, and you go, well, wait a minute, you can't walk into the presence of God. You know, you can't walk directly into the presence of God. I think of Isaiah when he had a vision of the throne room of God and he threw himself on the floor saying, saying, I am going to die because I'm a man of unclean lips. Isaiah, this righteous prophet of God, even saw himself as unclean before God. And so for that reason, whenever we see God depicted in his throne room and people entering in, we get cherubims. Okay, these are divine beings with wings, angels you might call them. And so on the Ark of the Covenant, there are cherubims that go before, they're attached to, and their wings cover the center of the mercy seat. So that as the Lord comes down to sit on the mercy seat, that the wings of the cherubim cover his face. So that the countenance of God doesn't destroy Moses or the priests as they enter in. And that's the image that happens here. And so Moses comes in, he has an experience of the glory of God, but he doesn't see the face of God, so he doesn't die. But then it's beautiful in the text. He leaves the tent of meeting, and his, his face is glowing, and the people are like, oh my gosh, Moses, your face is glowing, so he wraps it in a towel. Anyway, that's a different story, but that's what happens. I obviously have to paraphrase an awful lot of this to get through it, but the ark is the throne of God within the tabernacle. Okay, so why did... Why did God command the Israelites to build this tabernacle? I want to take a step back. And it's so that he could reside in the, multi, in the, the most holy of place. And, it was, and the people could have a pathway into the presence of God. So that the people would have a pathway into the presence of God. The tabernacle wasn't just a tent 
where they did ancient archaic sacrifices that don't matter to us anymore. It was where they walked step by step through the process of being consecrated, of being forgiven, of being washed, so that they can enter into the presence of their God and King. And so here the tabernacle for Israel in the wilderness, it is a type of the heavenly tabernacle. I want you to remind you that. That before the Israelites built a tabernacle, there was already a tabernacle. And it was a tabernacle in the heavens, a tabernacle of God. And, and God showed that to Moses so he could build this tabernacle on earth. And, and, and it's with that point I want to turn and look at the heavenly tabernacle now. I want to look at the book of Revelation, the book that nobody wants to read, right? The book full of images and scary things. All right, so what did Moses see? He saw this heavenly tabernacle. So we get a number of images about, ab about the tabernacle. Um, we're not going to go through every one of them, just some of the major ones. First, we get the Ark of the Covenant itself. I'm going to work through them backwards ideologically, from the center out. The first thing we get is the Ark. Revelation 4, 6, and 5, 6. Around the throne, and by the way, you can read their Ark, right? Because the Ark of the Covenant was the, was the thing that, that Yahweh sat on when he came down, right? So the ark is the throne. Around the ark, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures. As these liver, living creatures are described in Revelation, it seems obvious they are the cherubim. So there's four cherubim around the ark. Between the throne, or the ark, and the four living creatures, the cherubim, and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. The image is this. Last week we celebrated both the death of Jesus on Good Friday on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus on, 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 on Easter Sunday. But it actually doesn't stop there. A lot of churches will, on this day or at a date in the future, celebrate the Ascension Day, the, the day that the Lord rose not just from the earth, but he actually ascends to the heavens. That He, he actually ascends on the clouds, we're told in the book of Acts. He, he gets back on that cloud that transfers him between realms, if you will. He goes back to the heavenly tabernacle, and that's what we see here. That he's entering in, he's appearing before the Ark of the Covenant, or before the throne of God. Just as Yahweh appeared to Moses between the mercy seat and behind the cherubim, Jesus appeared in the throne room of God between the throne and the divine creatures, the cherubim, the angels. And I want you to notice a, an important detail here. Because in the tabernacle, you get this sense like the high priest gets consecrated, washed, he offers his incense, puts the blood on the altar on the Day of Atonement, and then he slips through this curtain from the holy place into the most holy place where the throne is. And all the other priests are over there in the holy place, in the bigger room, and they're like, when's he going to come out? And they're in anticipation. What's happening in there? What's being revealed? What, you know, and, 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 and they're in anticipation of the, the high priest coming back out. In other words, the elders of Israel are waiting because they, to see what's happening in, in, on the other side of the veil. Well, notice what it says here about the elders. It says that Jesus appeared between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. I don't know if you're seeing what I'm seeing, but there's no veil. That in John's revelation, the veil is, is gone. It's, it's disappeared. The elders are present in the most holy place, the, the place that they previously weren't allowed to enter. Now they enter into freely. In the tabernacle, it's only for the high priest, but here they're all there. All of the elders, all of the priesthood. And the lampstand is there. Revelation 4, 5. Before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. For those of you guys who remember our Revelation series, and if you want a refresher, I, don't, I think ask Tolina or Cody. They'll get you the link um, to this message. But there's, a, there's, a, there's a, at least one message, if not several, on Revelation 2 and 3, and then on 4 and 5, where we look at the throne room of God. And Revelation 4 and 5 reflect on the seven churches mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3. And what it's basically said, and the seven churches represent all churches in all time, but what's basically said is that there is a torch for each one of them. That the seven candelabras of the tabernacle are now sort of divvied up among the seven 
the seven churches. Each church has its own lampstand. But notice what it says. It says, before the throne were seven burning torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And in Reve Revelation 2 and 3, you get that same, that same thing, that it's not just seven torches that represent the churches, but there are seven spirits that go forward, or seven angels that go forward, so that the churches have their own angels. It's kind of the idea. In other words, that as the Lord leads his church, he does so according to his spirit. That we're not here trying to figure it out. We're not trying to do some Bible code nonsense and figure out what the Bible says and just try to enact it and hope it works, hope something takes, hope that we're accepted in the end. No, it is God by his spirit that is crafted and designed, not just the scriptures itself, but, but, but as we pray and we seek God and we send up incense that he sends his spirit upon us to reveal to us and to know how it is that we should live and how it is that we should worship and your elders, how it is that we should lead this congregation. Like, that's really what's happening here. And so the danger in Revelation 2 and 3, each one of those past churches receives a warning. Repent of this, do this, lest your lampstand go out. And it's the same promise that was given to Zerubbabel. Don't do this by your own might or power, but according to the Spirit of God. Remember, that's what the lampstand was about in the temple. And that's what it's about for us as the lampstand burns in the tabernacle of God, the heavenly tabernacle. The lamp is for illumination. And it speaks of how God illuminates his word to us, how he illuminates his truth to us. And he does so according to what? According to his Holy Spirit. And so the torch burns for us because the torch is the Spirit of God. And then up, we also have the incense censure. Revelation 5, 8, and also 8, 3, and 4. The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp, that's a different conversation, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So as these elders are there, and they're worshiping in the heavenly tabernacle, they have our prayers in their hands. This is, as Cody led us in prayer over our nation and our country, and all of all of the different things over our church, over us, as you pray at home or on the dinner table, as you pray at night, you wake in the morning to offer those mor your morning prayers, right? You're, they're holding, right now in the, in the heavenly tabernacle, the saints are holding your prayers. And they're holding them before the Father so that as we speak, they come up before the Father and he hears them and he knows them. And he goes on, he says, Another angel came and stole, stood at the altar with a golden censure, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. It's this idea that just like we are offering up our prayers, our incense here from the earth, that the angels are are receiving this angel. He's receiving those prayers in heaven. And he's taking that incense and he's holding it before the face of God. That's why the Apostle Paul says that you have the right to boldly come before the throne because Jesus has opened a pathway for you into the throne room of God. And we imagine when we pray that we walk in and we speak before the Lord. But even the ancients imagined that through the incense that our prayers were delivered to him. And then I think maybe my favorite part of this is that the courtyard is there. The courtyard is there. And again, not only can the elders see into the most holy place, but look at Revelation. Oh, I put the wrong reference, actually. I put Revelation 5.11, and I think it was 10. But anyway, if you go search around Revelation 5.11, you'll find it. Revelation 5.11 says, I heard the throne of the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. And I put the wrong verse. The group of people that's missing from this verse is all of the people of God. The saints, the holy ones of God are missing from this verse. So I apologize, but I put the wrong one. But it's this, it's that, it's that even from the courtyard into the holy place, 
that the veil has been removed. That Jesus, when he went to the cross and he died, and we're told that the earth shook and the veil was torn in two from top to bottom, that that, that just wasn't, and, and as evangelical Christians, we often say, oh, that's just about abandoning the temple system, and now we have a new way to worship. And it's like, no, it's not new. It's that the veil has been torn so that not just the veil in the temple that was there in Jerusalem, but the veil in heaven was torn so that the people of God can enter into the presence of the Almighty. So that just as the elders, their veil was torn so that they can see the most holy place, guess what? You and I are there around the throne. And we get to enter into the presence of the Almighty too. The throne room of God is open to all who belong to the Lamb, which is Jesus. And it's interesting because this gives me also, there's some imagery of the new heaven and the new earth. So as you get to the fulfillment of all things, that's this throne room image is something you should have now. Like what's happening in the heavenly tabernacle now? Well, the veil has been torn so that we can enter in. We don't need a priest. We can, pr- we can pray and our, and our prayers and petitions, they go into the hands of the angel to be delivered before Christ so he hears us, right? It's, it's that, but then there's, there's an eternal consummation when Christ returns for his people. In Re- Revelation 21 and 22, the new heaven and the new earth come down. And what's beautiful about this is the throne of God, the throne of the Lamb, it's in the middle of the city. Again, there's no veil. And we're told that the light of the glory of Christ shines over all of the earth so that the sun, the moon, and the stars need not exist because the light comes from the Lamb that is Christ. And it's this idea that, like, it doesn't matter where you are on the earth, in the new earth, you see the glory of Christ. You're in communion with God at all times. You're always eternally and forever in the presence of the Almighty, in the presence of God. And it's so beautiful because it's actually like it's, it's, it's sort of a retelling of the story of the Garden of Eden, if you will. Because in the Garden of Eden, you have the first man, Adam. You have humanity that's placed in the garden. And in the story, they're, you know, Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. They, you get the sense that they walk and they talk with, with God in the coolness of the day. There's nothing in there about being consecrated before they can see Yahweh. They're just there with him. They're there in his garden, in his paradise, on his mountain, communing with him in perfection. But then as they disobey God and sin enters the world, you know what happens? They get sent out of the garden and a veil is dropped and a cherubim is placed so that they can't enter back into the holy place. You see, the tabernacle existed. The veils in the tabernacle existed so that humans can't enter back into the presence of God and die. But when Jesus came and he washes us and he purifies us and he makes us whole again, the veil is torn in two so we can enter in again. It's all one story. Genesis to Revelation, it's all one story. So the tabernacle and ultimately Jesus, they serve for us as a way back into Eden, a way back into the perfect presence of God. And so the heavenly tabernacle, God's throne room, demonstrates as much as the earthly tabernacle did for the Israelites, it demonstrates for us a a pathway, if you will, into the presence of God. And unlike the earthly tabernacle, there again, there are no veils. And so maybe this is going to answer some questions for you, if you've wondered about like, wait, wait, why are they priests in the Old Testament, but then we call them elders in the New Testament? Wait, wait, what's that about? Why are the leaders of Israel in the Old Testament priests? And why are the leaders of of the the new Israel or the fuller Israel, the church, why are they elders? What's that about, right? Well, and it's because of this, because the leaders of these movements take on a different role. Now now that anyone can enter in, you, you actually don't need, capital N, need, you don't need a priest. Now, I'm not gonna say it's not helpful because if you come to faith in Jesus and you're like, well, well, I don't, I don't know how to pray. Well, then let's bring you somebody that knows how to pray, right? So, so this is why we have elders, and we have leaders and deacons in our church. We have people to, to teach you and to walk with you and to train you and to, and, and, and to help you be, because we are a kingdom of priests. We're all capable of entering in, but when you come to faith, you need to learn how to enter in. You need to learn how to pray. You need to learn the scriptures. You need to learn to worship. You need to learn the story of God. 
You need to grow in that. There needs to be a pathway to develop into, the, into a mature Christian. And so elders serve this purpose of spiritual leadership, but sort of in a different way than the priests. Again, the priests, they were facilitators. They were the ones who were washed, who were cleansed, who had a right into the presence of God when the other people didn't. And so even though they participate in the worship, they needed the priest who was consecrated. That elders lead and teach Christians how to worship and how to live so that you can grow in your, if you will, in your priesthood, in your priestliness, so that you can grow into that, so that you can now lead and teach others to do the same. The veil has been torn. We can all enter in. We just have to know how to do it. We just have to grow in it. And so all enter through the blood of Jesus Christ, who is our, we're told, great high priest. So I know this has been long. It's maybe the, maybe the largest, you might say, motif of Scripture, this idea of the temple and the tabernacle, and so there's a lot to it. But I want to look at Jesus for a few minutes as, as we close. Jesus, Jesus is both, in a sense, the tabernacle and also the priest of the tabernacle. Look at John 1.14. John 1.14 says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Some translations say that he lived among us. Um, the actual word there is a funny word. It's best translated maybe tabernacled, that Jesus tabernacled among us, like he went camping with us or something like that. It's kind of what it's saying. Like, like he came and pitched his tent alongside us, right? Um, and yet, because it's the word for tabernacle, uh, there's actually something fuller happen happening here because tabernacling is for entering into the presence of God. And that's actually Jesus' primary, ex primary objective as he comes to earth. When Jesus is born into the earth and he starts his ministry, what he's doing is he's constantly calling people into the presence of God. He's showing them how to enter in. And then ultimately, by his obedience to death on the cross and rising from the dead, he is actually delivering us out of the kingdom of darkness, out of the kingdom of death, and into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. He's actually bringing us into the presence of the Almighty. He's bringing us just in a shocking way all the way into the holiest place. And in this verse, John 14, 6, Jesus told them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father through me, except through me. Must have been completely shocking. We like to use that verse to say, yeah, see, not Islam, not Hinduism, not, and, and like, yeah, that's true. But just think how a first temple Jew would have heard that. Oh my gosh, they would have lost their minds. Because they knew that the tabernacle and the, and the temple and the temple system was their way to the Father. And now Jesus says, essentially, I am the tabernacle. No one comes to the Father but through me. And they're like, what about the temple? And Jesus is like, I am the temple. Destroy this temple. And in three days, and I will raise it up. And so Jesus is the tabernacle. He is the temple, but he's also the high priest of the tabernacle. Hebrews 9, with these things prepared like this, the priests entered the first room repeatedly, were performing their ministry, but the high priest alone enters the second room, but he only does it once a year. And never without blood, which he offers for himself for the sins that the people had committed in ignorance. He's reflecting on the old system. First room, second room, You've got to be consecrated to enter in. But Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come in the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. He entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. You see this, that he is the tabernacle that leads us into the presence of God. He is the priest who made sacrifice to enter in. He has been consecrated. And so we, as we follow Jesus, have too been consecrated to enter into God's presence. The Christian life is essentially this. It is following the way. It is following Jesus through the tabernacle. It is being consecrated through the blood of Jesus and entering deeper and deeper into the most holy place. It is entering into the most holy place to have an experience and, 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 and of the presence of the Almighty. 
It's going deeper in. It's like in the Narnia series, C.S. Lewis. And I love this one statement there. At the end of the whole series, they're searching for Aslan. Um, and they're in Aslan's place, his home, his realm. And it's like Narnia, except perfect. And they're, they're looking for Aslan. And they're told that to find him, they need to go further in and further up. And that's, that's the reality is that it's this idea that even to make it into the holiest place, we can continue to search and to yearn for God that although we have come into life, we have come into the kingdom of God, we continue to pursue him to go further in and further up and to continue to dig deeper and further into the heart of God, to know him more, to love him more, to commune with him more. And I know that the church is a place where people find all sorts of of physical, emotional, social needs met. And I think that's right, and I think that's good. It's what Jesus showed us to do, to love each other as he first loved us, right? That's what he showed us to do, and it's what he commanded us to do. But I think the church is first and foremost a place where people get spiritual needs met. It's a place where where even if our physical lives are falling apart or our emotional lives are falling apart or our social lives are full of broken relationships, it's a place, it's a place that we can come and we can enter in and, that we, and, and then we enter into God's presence to know him so that even as the Israelites were in the wilderness and at times they were hungry and at times they were thirsty and at times they were hot and at times they were uncomfortable or in pain, that the tabernacle was there with them and they could look up and they could see the pillar of cloud by day and they could see the pillar of fire by night and they saw it resting on the most holy place and they knew that the Lord was with them and they knew that they had entered into his presence and they could find peace in that. And that's really what it is that is as you find satisfaction in the presence of God, you can have that apart from all of the physical and emotional and social needs that you might be searching for. And so we come, and this is going to sound in some ways kind of repetitive to things that we read in other places in the scripture, but we come to worship him and to enter in together even this morning. And we do so in, in different ways. We do so by the Lord's Supper. We do so by the Lord's Supper that we, that we come into, and, and if you think of a traditional church building, I don't know if you can do that right now, but if you think of a traditional church building, You've probably never noticed this, but it's the shape of a tabernacle. That it's long and skinny. And so you come through, you come through into a foyer, usually, that is the courtyard, and then you enter into a second set of doors. And by the way, in a lot of church traditions, they leave those doors open. They don't care how much noise is outside. They leave those doors open because the veil has been torn. And they come into a long, skinny sanctuary where at the end of it, there is again no veil. And then the, the Lord's Supper elements sit on the, in the center, in the highest place in the sanctuary. And they do this because that's how the tabernacle was set up. And maybe you never knew that, but that's why. So that as the people come and they, they come to have an experience of God and, they, and, and the, the elements are blessed and they're offered in the Lord's Supper and they come forward to receive that. They come forward to receive that at the seat of mercy as if it were the throne room of God. And Jesus said to do this in remembrance of me. And in in that act of celebrating the Lord's Supper, it's all about remembering that Jesus is the one who has torn the veil so that you can enter in. That any experience that you have of the Almighty, it's it's unique to this era of the church when when the veil is torn and we can enter in. And we give him thanks in the Lord's Supper. That's what Eucharist means, another term that we sometimes throw around. It's the thanksgiving, it's the thankfulness that by his shed blood that we enter in. And you may have noticed that we emphasize teaching. There was a lot of teaching in this message. And I wanted to make it shorter for comfort's sake, but I didn't want to make it shorter and lose the fullness of the picture of of what's happening in the tabernacle in Israel. We teach and we read scripture 
so that you can know God more. You can know his plan. You can know his purpose. You can, you can see his face more clearly so that you can go deeper in, and, you know, further in and further up. And we pray, continually offering incense. And our prayers go before the face of God so that he hears us. Look, every petition... Every asking, every praise, every moment of adoration, every, every, every thankful prayer that you pray, even every groan that you pray without words, and every moment of silence that is speechlessness or listening, that he hears it, and it comes into the heart of God so that he answers it. And I think Maybe for some of you have noticed, but I just said, come to church and listen, read the scriptures and pray. Um, but maybe I've said that in a fuller sense that will allow you to see the significance of that. That when we gather to worship and to participate in the Lord's Supper, we gather for teaching and the reading of scripture, we gather for prayer, that we are truly entering into the presence of the Almighty. That we're being fulfilled in the one way that nobody has ever both been fulfilled outside of the church of Christ. And I think that is the most beautiful thing. Let's, let's take a moment and offer our incense up now. Lord, we come before you thankful for your word. We, we're so thankful that it's one story that the images are consistent from beginning to end. And I, I confess that it's difficult. and I've probably not understood it all correctly at all times, but I just pray that you would help us to see more deeply into your word that by your spirit is, that is here, the spirit that you've sent to your church, your Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us to just illuminate truth to us, Lord, that we might see your face more clearly. Allow us insight into the heart and mind and life of Jesus. That as we seek to live like him, empower us by your spirit in every way that you would. And we pray that as you hear our prayers today, as our incense comes into your throne room, that you'd be pleased with us, your people here at Palmdale Church. We thank you this morning for the experience of entering into the presence of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.